Amen, let's pray. Lord, you are the champion. You are the only one who deserves our worship and our praise. You are above all else. And yet you chose and have chosen to come and to dwell in the midst of your people. And so today we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and to speak to our lives, to speak to our hearts, to speak to our situations. Lord, we declare today that the testimonies we've just heard are not the only ones we're going to hear, that there are miracles that are ready to break through. There are transformations that are ready to break through. There are marriages that are going to be restored. There are bodies that are going to be healed. There are hearts that are going to be healed. There are minds that are going to be renewed. There are families that are going to be saved. There are communities that are going to experience revival. There is this city that is going to see the banner of your glory and your power and your victory risen over every estate, over every prison, over every hospital, over every school, over every university. But Lord, it starts right here in our lives this morning. So Lord, bring us into that full maturity of faith that you speak about. So we surrender ourselves to you today. Speak and lead, but Lord, we want to respond. So we commit this time to you and we give you all the honour, the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a praise offering this morning. Praise Lord, you can take your seats. And as you do that, I'm gonna ask you to turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 11. Um, and we're continuing with our giant slaying series. And not only that, but that coincides with our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I'm not sure how you find fasting, but for me, I don't find it easy. I'm not someone that can show off or, or talk about how much I've fasted from this and fasted from that. I'm not a, what would you say, a master faster. I struggle a little bit. I like food, I love food. But yet one of the things that I've committed to fasting from for these 21 days is fizzy drinks. And if you know me, that's difficult. Coke and Iron Brew especially. And Harry Bow for Curtis. But you know, you know when you get those weird temptations? I went for lunch with my wife this week. Um, coming home from university, I went. And we went into a, a place and they had like one of those lunch deals where you get a special deal. And so we sat down, we ordered the food. And there was only two drinks you could order. Either a fizzy drink or alcohol. So I was like, well, I'm not going to do the alcohol. And I can't do the fizzy drink. So he said to me, you know what? We don't want a drink. And she said, well, you have to order one. I was like, but I don't want one. Well, you have to order it or you don't get the deal. So I was going back and forth for a few minutes and I was like, you know what, just, just bring a Coke. And the whole time that we're having lunch, my wife, you know when someone's talking to you but they're not listening, when you're talking to someone and they're not listening, right? They're looking around. My wife was talking to me the whole lunch and I just kept looking at this bottle of Coke sitting on the table. And after about half an hour, I just slid it over to her and said, you need to drink that right now because otherwise I'm breaking my fast and I'm not even gonna be ashamed of it. You know, you get those, but you know what? I can stand here today and say I'm nine days fizzy free. And I'll be 21 days fizzy free. And I won't be 22 days. <laughs> because I'm, at the end of that 21st day, I'm going to break it. <laughs> but you know, in Psalms chapter 11, verse 2 and 3, I want to read a couple of verses. And it says this. David penned this psalm. And I really believe that the giant that we're going to talk about today is a giant that when it's slain, there's going to be a greater freedom and victory in your walk than ever before. Psalms 11, verse 2 and 3 says this. For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want to say that last part again. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous 
do. You know, if you've been around church for a while, if you've been around Christians for a while, there's certain phrases or quotes or scriptures that will get mentioned in church that if they're not explained or if you don't understand them, will be more annoying than encouraging. The certain things that you hear that get said, and, you, and if, unless you can really know exactly how to live that scripture out, it can get challenging. One of them you hear in church a lot is, understanding will come later. How many of you have heard that? Understanding will come later. And if you're anything like me, you'll say to yourself, but I'm not living in later, I'm living in now, and I want understanding now. If you ever heard the quote or the phrase, listen for the voice behind the voice. That's just weird. And it sounds, it just sounds like, I oh, know what, I don't want to do that. Have you ever been talking to someone about your struggle or your issue and they say this phrase, this is my favorite, have you given it to God? I'm like, no, but I'm going to give something to you. It's, it's that, how do you do that? Lastminute.com. That's a website, it's not a philosophy of ministry. And then the favorite one is guard your heart. How do you do that? How do you guard your heart? How, when it's, the Bible says that guard your heart for out of it spring the issues of life. And the giant I wanna talk to us about today, I believe without knowing everyone's life, so without knowing the ins and outs of every one of your situations, the giant we're gonna speak about today is a giant that each and every one of us will face. You see, there's some giants that are unique to you, maybe based on where you were born or how you were raised or the job you're in or whatever it might be. There might be certain unique giants that you face, but there are some common giants that no matter whether you are old or young, no matter whether you are rich or poor, no matter whether you've been saved 20 years or 20 days, there are some giants that each and every one of us will face. See, I don't know what scars you've brought in. I don't know what wounds you might walk with. I don't know what dreams you carry, what victories you've experienced or what setbacks you've faced. But I can guarantee you today that the giant we speak about today, you've either faced or you're about to face. The giant I wanna talk about today is how do we slay the giant of offense? How do we slay the giant of offense? Because it's the heart and it is that spirit of offense that can limit the victory and the freedom and the peace and the joy and the power that you and I are called and fashioned and created to walk in. Today, some of us are gonna slay that giant of offense. I wanna give you the definition of offense real quick according to the dictionary. There's three definitions, it says this. Offense is the breach of a law or rule. The breach of a law or rule. The other description, it says that offence is something that outrages the moral or physical senses. Something that outrages the moral or physical senses. They're tapping into some type of frequency. <laughs> and the third thing that offence is, it's a breach of a moral or social code. So offence is the response to a violation or an injustice that has been committed towards something or someone. And in your life and my life, offense is our response to when we believe that there's been an injustice committed against us. For your life and my life today, offense is when something takes place in our life and offense is our response to that. Sometimes relationships don't turn out how we want them to and there can be offense that creeps in. Sometimes we step out in faith and it doesn't work out how we thought it was gonna work out. Offense can creep in, our heart can get challenged. And so in our lives, we have to learn how to overcome our heart and that spirit of offense. David posed this question, what can the righteous do when their foundation is being destroyed? I wanna put it to us today that as important as prayer is, as important as it is to learn how to connect with God, how to learn to call out to God, how to learn to spend time in intimacy with God, Prayer is not the foundation of our life. I want to even put it to us today that even the scriptures that give us the, the revelation and the story and the, the character of God, it teaches us how to walk as a Christian, a follower of God, is not the foundation of our life. Because if you're anything like me, have you met people that can pray for hours, but yet they don't change? Have you ever met someone that knows a thousand and one scriptures, but they don't change? 
I know people that know scriptures better than me, more, more, more thoroughly than me, but yet the transformation is lacking. Honour and worship and giving, as important as they are, they're not the foundation of our life. David says, and scripture shows us, that the heart is the foundation of our life. And prayer and worship and giving and all of these things are the ingredients that go into creating a pure heart. But you can pray and not change. You can give and not change unless you let God get onto the inside of you and begin to transform you. And he uses prayer and worship and community to begin to transform your foundation. So when David poses the question, what can the righteous do? You can stand up and say, when my foundation is secure, the righteous can do anything that God calls them to do. But when your foundation is shaky, when you walk with offence, when your heart is wounded, it doesn't matter how big your dreams are, eventually the foundation will crumble. But when you are called by God and you let him work on your foundation, you let him transform your foundation, you let him break you down so that he can build you back up, your foundation will be the platform so that you can say the righteous can do anything that they are called to do but it's our heart that is the foundation. And David says that the enemy shoots from the shadows. He shoots from the secret places. You know, when those arrows get fired of accusation or discouragement, when those arrows get fired that God has forgotten you or God's not gonna fulfill his word, when those arrows get fired, there's one of three responses that the giant wants you to respond with. He wants you to respond by isolating yourself, condemning yourself, or exalting yourself. He wants you to respond. If you can do one of those three things, then he's got you where he wants you. To isolate yourself, I always use this analogy if you watch the nature programs and you see the predator, the lion, or the tiger, or the jackal, or whatever else it might be, they lay low in the grass. And what they wait for is they wait for that one animal that has separated itself from the pack. That animal can be strong, it can be strong, I don't know what other word to use, it can be whatever, it could look like the strongest animal in the pack, but if it's not a part of the pack, if it's separated itself, then eventually that predator is gonna target it. And likewise, in the opposite sense, you can be wounded, discouraged, you can be struggling, you can be worrying, but if you stay in the center of the pack, if you stay in the community, if you stay a part of that, that, that family and that, all, that place, then no matter how discouraged you might feel, no matter how, set, how many setbacks you go through, that predator, that enemy can't get to you because you're a part of the family and the community. The enemy wants you to isolate yourself when he comes with his accusations. He wants you to condemn yourself. You know, sometimes we put the devil out of a job because we do his job for him. There's a big difference between condemnation and conviction. You see, condemnation will cause you to step back. Conviction will cause you to step forward. Condemnation will cause you to look down, but conviction will cause you to look up. And sometimes in most seasons of life where we've not had the success we may have thought we were gonna have, a relationship's not turned out how we thought it may, there's that, that opportunity to begin to condemn ourselves. Or the third one, not only could we isolate ourselves or condemn ourselves, but sometimes we exalt ourselves. Because we get hurt, what do we say? You know what? No one's gonna hurt me again. And we big ourselves up. No one's gonna have that place in my life again. So we exalt ourselves. But the truth is this, if we can expose the giant this morning, is that the isolation, condemnation, and pride are the three spirits that the enemy works under. Because he exalted himself against God, God condemned him and separated him. So anything that you go through in your life is the opportunity to isolate, to be condemned, or to exalt yourself, but God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to operate under a different spirit, that you might be struggling, but instead of isolating, you bring yourself further into the community. Instead of condemning yourself, you begin to speak the word over yourself. That even David said, when your foundation's been destroyed, he says, what can the righteous do? It's amazing that he still speaks about those that have struggled as righteous. He doesn't say because of what you've gone through that you're not righteous anymore. He still says you're righteous. We have to speak the word over ourselves. But the truth is, is when you're living in community and you're living in family and you're living life with people, it's easy to get hurt. And the truth is this is that you can't ever stop yourself getting hurt, but you can stop yourself staying hurt. 
you can stop yourself living hurt. One of the scriptures that has really shaped my approach to, to life and to ministry and to people is the Apostle Paul when he wrote to the church in Thessalonica and he made a statement and this statement was a real shaping time in my life of how I should approach ministry and the life that we live in as a Christian. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 6 to 8, it says this, even though we had some standing as Christ's apostles, we never threw our weight around or tried to come across as important with you or anyone else. We weren't aloof with you. We took you just as you were. We were never patronizing, never condescending, but we cared for you the way a mother cares for her children. We loved you dearly. And this is the statement right here. The Apostle Paul says, not content just to pass on the message. We wanted to give you our hearts, and we did. Another version says, not satisfied with just giving you the gospel, we gave you our lives as well. You see, it's not enough just to give people the truth. We need to give people our lives. You see, it's easy to tell people how to live, but it's not as easy to learn how to live with people. Anyone can tell someone how to live, but do you know how to live life with that person? Even Jesus, the Bible says, he came in truth and in grace. You see, the Apostle Paul shared his life. But when you share your life, the storms and the seasons can leave you damaged or hurt. The storms and seasons can leave you offended or doubtful. And this is where David's words become so key. This is where David's words become the very foundation of how we overcome those troubled hearts, how we overcome those challenging seasons. David says in Psalms 119, verse 112, he says this, I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. You know the language that David uses, I incline my heart. If you need to incline something, that means it's not naturally positioned that way. That means that you have to make an adjustment. What David was saying, in everything that I've faced and gone through, I have to choose every day to incline my heart, to turn it to God and his word, because it's not naturally positioned that way. It's not naturally positioned in that sense. And every morning, you and I have a responsibility in every relationship, in every season, to incline our heart, to turn it towards God. Because you see, anything that needs inclining has a default position. Like a treadmill, you incline it. Like one of those easy sit couches, you can incline it. I've got more experience with couches than treadmills. But the reality is that you need to incline it. And if you don't turn your heart to God every day, if you don't turn your heart in every relationship to God, if you don't do that, you will walk in the default position of your heart. And that default position might be anger or loneliness or disappointment. But I want to declare this morning, just like David, that if you incline your heart towards God through every storm, if you incline your heart towards God in every season, if you incline and adjust your heart and turn it to God through every setback, every victory, every circumstance, then eventually that healing will take place. Eventually that breakthrough will come. But we need to incline towards God. Because if you don't incline, you will recline. And if, if you recline, you'll end up declining. So if you don't turn your heart to God by choice, you'll end up declining. Our hearts will end up declining. Our lives will end up declining. But like David, we have to make the choice to incline. Someone say incline. We have to turn our hearts towards God. There's two areas I want to look at this morning for the next 10, 10, about 10 minutes. Two areas where offense can creep into our life. We can feel offended by people and we can feel offended by God. I'm not saying God offends us, but we can feel offended by God. And you see, when it comes to people, offense usually comes from two things. And I'm going to go in this morning. I'm going to go a little bit deeper. Is that Okay. Offence comes with people for two reasons. Because of jealousy and because of injustice. Injustice is when you've been done wrong. 
Jealousy is when you haven't been done wrong, you just think you have. You see, people know that when I speak, I share stories about my children a lot. And I have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, Brooklyn and George. And there's three things about my daughter, if you ever speak to her. If you haven't spoken to her, you probably will by the end of the service, because she will find you if she doesn't know you. And there's three things you will learn about my daughter. One, she has a relationship with God. She's eight years old, and she knows the presence of God. She knows the word of God. And she just, she's got a genuine relationship with God. The second thing about my daughter is that she has no filter. She will tell you it exactly how it is. If you see her, she'll look at you, she'll look at you, and she'll work out something to say that's awkward. Before we go into anyone's house, my wife and myself are always like, now remember, we don't talk about this, 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 and this. But she will find something and she will say it. She has no filter. In the eight years, though, that I've known my daughter, that we've had our daughter, and we're talking about this week, she has never said one bad word about anyone. We've never heard her say one bad word. When she's been bullied, we've never heard her say one bad word. When she's been made fun of, we've never heard her say one bad word. But yet the third thing about my daughter is that she struggles with insecurity. She struggles with it. Is that she could walk past you and you'll be laughing and she'll think you're laughing at her. There's a struggle that she faces in her life of jealousy, of insecurity. And that's the responsibility that my wife and myself have been given to raise this girl in the things of God and the love of God so that she doesn't walk like that. But yet... Even when things aren't being said about her, even when no one's doing anything to her, sometimes she thinks that people are. And that's jealousy, is that sometimes we fix our eyes and get offended by people, even though they've not done anything wrong to us. You see, jealousy comes from insecurity. Insecurity comes from a lack of intimacy with God. And we have to be intimate with God. We have to know who we are, who he's called us to be. There was a man in the Bible who had everything you could ever hope for and still jealousy got the better of him. There was a man in the Bible who was powerful, successful, wealthy, respected, good looking, the Bible even says, tall, all of these things, and yet jealousy still got the better of him. And his name was King Saul. And in 1 Samuel 18, verse 6 to 9, it says this. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. So Saul was angry. Saul was angry even though they were praising him. Saul was angry even though they were celebrating him. Saul was angry, even though they were singing about him. And you see, the truth is, is you can have everything you pray for and yet still be insecure. You can have everything that you've ever asked for from God and still look at other people wanting what they have. And we have to be content and assured of who God has created us to be and what he wants to do in our life. I've said this before, Saul was meant to face Goliath, but he hid. And David stepped forward and fought Goliath. And the truth is this, is if you don't learn to slay your giant, you'll slay your brother or sister. If you don't learn to fight your enemy, you will fight your family. Because he was meant to fight Goliath, but because he hid from Goliath, he got jealous of the person that fought him. Some of us in the church, if we learn to slay our giants, there will be less gossip. There'll be less internal fighting. There'll be less politics. There'll be less, and I'm not just talking about this church, every church. Every church. If we learn to slay our giants, we'd learn to love each other in a better way. Paul speaks about, can the clay turn to the potter and say, why did you make me this way? We have to be assured of who God has called us to be. We have to be a people that study the scriptures, the word of God, knowing what God says about you. But the reality is this, is the second area we can get offended by people is through injustice. We can get hurt, genuinely. We can get wronged, genuinely. We can get damaged, genuinely. And it's not just in our minds. It happens. It happens. There's a story that I read, and I watched a documentary on it, and it was about an Amish community about 25 years ago. And there was a shooting that took place in this Amish community in their school, and someone had killed 10 of the children there. And the mother was called back to the house, the mother of the, 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 the son that did it. 
And she, she was called back to the house and she said that she was preparing to move out of the area because she knew what was going to come. She knew that the community was going to ask her to leave because of what her son had did. And it says they got, she got the knock at the door and she was ready to leave. And it was the mother and fathers of some of those children that stood before her and said, we want you to stay in our community. We want you to remain with us. And not only that, but the day that came for the funeral for her to bury her son, the Amish community all came out and surrounded the area where she was going to do it so the media couldn't get to her. And they allowed her to do something that probably, I don't know, I wouldn't have been able to do. Yet the forgiveness and the, the love that was shown in that act that showed years later they were still living in that community, serving one another and loving one another. And the truth is, even when we get hurt, the response is what heals us. The response is what changes us. The response is what gives us the breakthrough. Jesus went through that. He was betrayed, rejected, mocked, and yet his response was with love. You see, Jesus, this is one of the things that really struck me. Jesus wasn't betrayed with a sword. He was betrayed with a kiss. It was the one closest to him that hurt him. And yet there's two things about Jesus' response that show us how we should respond to these things. The first one was his love, that he loved each and every one of his disciples the same way. Even the one that was going to betray him, he still loved him. He washed Judas' feet. He let Judas take communion. All of these things that seem outlandish or outrageous, Jesus knew what he needed to do. But the thing that I think had the biggest impact on how Jesus acted is his sense of mission and purpose. Is that even when someone came against him, he understood what he was called to do. He understood what his purpose was. He understood what his goal was, his mission. And you see, Jesus stood up at the beginning of his ministry in Luke chapter 4. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he says, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free. And he began to share his mission. And you see, when you know the mission and the calling and the purpose God has for you, you will overcome the rejections. You will overcome the offense. You will overcome those issues and seasons of our life. Because when we go back to what the meaning of offense is, offense is a sense of injustice, and it's our response to injustice. I want to put it to us today that we're meant to be offended, but we're offended at the wrong things. We're meant to be offended at suffering. We're meant to see the injustices around us and rebel and respond to that. We're meant to be offended at evil. We're meant to be offended at poverty. We're meant to be offended at homelessness, at racism. We're meant to be offended at injustice. These are the things that we're meant to be offended at. But I want to put it to us today that the church is meant to be offended at suffering, but we're too busy suffering in our offense. And if we learn to be offended at the right things, if we learn to be offended at the injustices around us, then we might overcome the offenses of our heart a bit quicker. But sometimes we're so consumed with what we've been through but we don't incline our heart towards God anymore. We don't incline our heart towards the word of God or to the community of God because we've been damaged. But we need to be offended at what we see going on around us because we use all our energy to be offended at our brother or sister and we don't have anything left to actually be offended by the injustices that take place in our country. And lastly, I'm going to start to wind this down. What happens when you feel offended by God? One thing to feel offended by people, what happens when you feel like God's let you down or God's forgotten you? You know, there was two people that went through offense in the Bible from, that felt offended by God. One was called Cain and one was called Gideon. We know how Cain responded when he killed his brother Abel. But in Judges chapter 6, verse 11 to 14, it says this. When God revealed himself to Gideon, it says in ch chapter 6, verse 11 to 14, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abazarite. And where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press, okay, you're not meant to thresh wheat in a wine press, to keep it from the Midianites, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Here's Gideon, pardon me, my Lord. Always nice to start polite if you're going to question God. 
Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? The first thing we see from this scripture is Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. He was in a place that he wasn't meant to be. Fear, offense, disappointment will cause you to function in areas that you're not called to function in. But the second thing that's, that, that, that strikes me about this scripture is that Gideon asked a very clear question to God, where have you been? God didn't answer that question. God didn't respond and say, you know what, Gideon, this is why, this is why this happened, this is when this happened, this is where I've been, I've been on my way, I was on my way, trust me. He didn't go into an explanation because God knew something Gideon didn't. God knew that the thing that Gideon thought was gonna bring him healing wasn't. God knew the thing that Gideon thought was going to give him his breakthrough wasn't. You see, sometimes we think that the why to our situations is what's going to give us our breakthrough. Sometimes we think the why to our circumstances is what's going to give us our breakthrough. But sometimes all you need to know is what's going to give you your breakthrough is the presence of God. It's to know that God is with you. And to overcome offense, to slay that giant, our responsibility is to incline and to turn our heart towards the presence of God to turn our heart towards the goodness of God. We heard the testimony from Yudi that even in pain, she continued to serve. And it was in serving, it was in inclining her heart to God that God brought healing and breakthrough. And this morning, whatever we're walking with, whatever's happened to our foundation, I wanna to declare to us today, according to the word of God, that if you incline your heart, that giant will be slain. If you incline your heart, that giant will come down. If you turn your heart towards God, each and every moment and season and relationship, that giant will be slain. And we come back to David's question. What can the righteous do? I wanna to say today, and I wanna declare for each and every one of us, that when your foundation is secure, when your heart is pure, when you work through those situations, the righteous can do anything that they are called to do. Whatever promise God has given you, you can fulfill it when your foundation is fixed. Whatever he has given you, you can fulfill it when your foundation is secure. Stand with me today. In Matthew 5, it says this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And a pure heart doesn't mean a perfect heart. Pure heart doesn't mean the absence of anything, but it's a heart that has been turned to God in every circumstance. And I want us to really lift our hands in this place today. And even in the prayer and fasting, as I was praying, this week, this was a word God was giving me. But you know, sometimes you need a little bit of confirmation. And I looked at the prayer and fasting manual. And today's day is called repairing your armor. And I believe that some of us in here today, there's some repairs that God wants to do. There's some tweaks that God wants to make. And for him to do that, we have to stand before him today and turn our heart to him and say, God, whatever those tweaks are, whatever those adjustments are, wherever there's a hole in my armor, wherever there is a gap in my life, Lord, I turn my heart to you so that you can fulfill your will and your purpose in my life. Come on, let's lift our hands right now all across this place. The Holy Spirit.